Yeah, I, I pretty much just assume anything I'm doing in the public sphere is, is going to be on the internet. So I remember when I, you know, when the internet kind of happened, when it arrived in, in, our, in our living rooms, essentially, and um, I remember really, really early on thinking, this could kind of go anywhere. <laughs> um, anything I put online, it's just, uh, I'm going to have to be able to explain it at some point. Um, and I'm going to start from day one, essentially, like if it's, if I put it online, then if it were ever to come out in public, I'm going to have to, like, I'm going to be fine with that. Right. And it's interesting to me that apparently a lot of people never, uh, never were that mindful about it. And, you know, look how many people have gotten in trouble over the years with that, with that, with the sort of information leaking yeah. stuff. I think there's still a lot of people getting in trouble with that. I mean... I just assumed that if I don't want it on a billboard somewhere, that I shouldn't put it on the internet. Mm. Uh, because you don't even know. It's not even just the secrets or whatever. It's, it's the pictures. It's things that can just be reappropriated from Google Images. I even had that before where a picture was taken for something from Hootsuite. And uh, I was pouring a beer and it was used to advertise at a university for like a beer course or something like that. And I was like, wait, that was like that? When they just... <laughs> Well, they just yanked it off of Google Images, and uh -huh. then they made a website out of it. These um, images may be copyrighted. Right, and uh, yeah, and so it was kind of a funny experience, but it um, it reinforced my thought that I have no ownership over this, and if I'm choosing to participate in this, then I can't control the outcome, and so I should work back from that thought. Right. Um, and a lot of people, you still see people on Instagram and things having these surprises where they're like, I didn't, and now it, it feels really baseless and it feels really selfish, And but you brought that out. Yeah. Right. And so I, I, we, I spend a lot of time trying to come to terms with this new technology and where the pendulum's swinging. There's got to be, there's got to be a whole hours long discussion in here, um, you know, focused around social media about this mm -hmm. pub, public private divide, but <laughs> let us jump ahead. Yeah. Right? Yes. Deal? Boing. Welcome to the Acquia Podcast, Drupal Technology, Community and Business. Welcome to the Acquia Podcast, Drupal Technology, Community and Business. There's a module for that? There, of course there is. This is the Acquia podcast. Um, it's a format where I have the great pleasure to be able to talk with people in and around technology, um, mostly with some connection to open source, and we have that today. Um, so, and it's, it's, uh, it's great to have you here. Thank you. Why don't you introduce yourself to all of us and, and tell us uh, what you do. Great. Uh, my name is Ambrosia Vertesi and I work at a company called Hootsuite, which is a social relationship platform or a social management platform. And I head up uh, talent or HR, corporate social responsibility, internal communications. And so I've been for the past almost five years managing the hyper growth of that organization from I was employee 20 and now we're a thousand employees in 12 countries now. Wow. So a lot of uh, showering stopped a long time ago and uh, we're just having a blast kind of being at the forefront of this social revolution that's kind of disrupting, ooh, that word I think will die pretty quickly, but um, is, is really changing the way the world communicates. Okay. We're not allowed to use the word disruption or oh. innovation or What's another There's word? There's other buzzword be? bingo. Um, disruption's definitely at the top of the buzzword bingo. Right. Uh, I think, you know, what's another word they hear a lot? Iterative. The iterative culture in, in my world is, is a big one. Oh, oh and uh, um, agile now. Agile. Right, yeah. which goes hand in hand with iterative. Yes. Oh, the abuse of language. Well, once, you see, once, you know, the more popular culture 
hooks on to what successful subcultures are doing, then they right. want to appropriate that. In this case, geek culture words yes. that show up in, in government, I'm, government conferences, government seminars I've gone to, yeah. agile, 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 agile. Yeah. We, we're agile now. How do we do agile? Um, you know, just like disruptive, yeah. um, just like innovative a few years ago. So Genuine, um, transparent. There's, there's a lot that I feel like uh, HR takes because we use it for recruiting. Right. So <laughs> well, I sit in marketing and, you know, we're the sinners here as well. <laughs> so um, I will link to this. You recently were a co-keynote speaker yeah. at a LinkedIn conference about uh, talent HR recruiting. Mm -hmm. It's a great presentation. I really enjoyed Thank it. Thank you. Thanks. Talk about the talent war. Yeah. So maybe this is, I mean, going back to, to buzzwords, I think maybe this is a marketing and HR construct, but for a long time, the conversation around recruitment was about this war for talent. There's not enough talent. It's a war. And, and people started adopting that and they started kind of thinking of it as this very, you know, combative, carnivorous environment that you had to step on each other in order to survive. And it was in every, like, if you Google it, there's just a, a horrible meme library. But um, <laughs> when HR does memes, it goes totally awry. But uh, it was this idea that I think was, was very destructive um, to the field and industry of HR practitioners. Because, um, you know, people are not resources, they're human beings. And when we're thinking about, you know, the idea that the rising tide floats all boats that we should all be putting more in the top of funnel and we should be building ecosystems and we should be collaborating on what's happening in the workforce and the you know in external environment that's competing with us instead of being like, we're going to war, I'm gonna fight you. Uh, you know, that's that mentality to me is very dangerous. And and so that was all in the space of, of sort of one-upsmanship in yeah. the number of foosball tables and beer taps. It's a perk war. It's a salary war. You, you saw a lot of that in the Silicon Valley. And when we, when we talk about talent, you're looking for that, you know, super experienced developer in yeah. the technology that's only six weeks old or like all the magic unicorns, yeah. all the people who like, what kind of talent was, was the subject of that? Any talent. It was just, there's not enough people for the roles that we need them for. Hmm. Let's go to war. And I'm fiercely competitive, I, I will put that out there, but I am collaborative before I'm competitive because I do believe that if we're working together that I will fight you on the playground later for talent, but if there's not enough coming in and we're just building these, these silos and we're all spending more money as businesses, we're not helping our businesses, we're not helping our people, um, that it's not working. And really, in reality, if my clients or my customers are... Um, people in the workforce, then why would I say it's a war for them? Mm. Uh, we don't talk about our customers that way. We talk about our customers as valued. We talk about educating our customers. We have, there's a very different narrative there. And so a lot of HR practitioners were like, this idea of the war for talent, like talent won a long time ago. Like that isn't even a question. They decide what they want their education to be. They decide what companies they want to work for and what problems they want to solve. I should be supporting and enabling them in that. And then supporting and enabling other practitioners about how we just get better at being employers that people want to work for. Because you look at the numbers of uh, disengaged people and you look at the numbers of people that are unhappy in their jobs or the number of companies that are not integrating work and life. Um, so, so this war on talent was kind of an external like yeah. battle of the perks or whatever. Yeah. And and people were not focusing on their internal company cultures of, of, of creating and, and retaining effective people and being a positive, good place to work? Is that... Uh... I think it's just, we all believe there's a shortage, but I, I think tackling it from a pay your way out of it or put in practices that are, you know, combative instead of collaborative was adding to the problem, not the solution. It was a shiny object. It was a red herring. It wasn't actually okay. going to resolve the problem. So we'll come back to that collaborative aspect in yeah. a moment. In the um, open source software world, PHP, yeah. Drupal world, um, there's a lot of success. There's a lot of business. There's a lot of work to do. Yeah. There's a great deal of demand. And essentially for a decade um, in, in Drupal, mm -hmm. 
people have been saying there's more work than than developers to do it. There's more work than we have people to cover it. Yeah. And yet we survive somehow. Um, talk about um, mentorship, training, t- other routes to creating talent instead of just mm-hmm. fighting for the existing senior developers. Mm-hmm. I think that if you know HR folks took a, a note from your guys' book about how you see yourself as there's a lot of work, we want to build really amazing things, and there's not enough of us. If we thought that same way of saying, there's a lot of work, there's, we want to do these amazing things, there's not enough of them, then of course you would look to partnerships with universities, you would look at resourcing the next generation of talent, you would look at mentorship programs with you guys, you would look at reverse mentorship programs to get the young talent to teach you what they know so that your cutting edge skills are there. Um, and then you know, telling that story. I mean, we're spending a lot of time on employer branding and stuff like that. Why are we not telling the story about the core competencies that are needed um, in business? Why are we not showing, you know, spending more time showing the data about the disconnect between what's being educated and what's being hired? Um, I think people are doing that now. I think there is a narrative there. But for a long time, it was, it was more so about you being like, there's not enough of you. You're so precious. And then these words, rock stars and ninjas and gurus and all these horrible things like kind of came about. Oh, right. Those are also forbidden now. Those are also <laughs> forbidden. Um, it, 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 and we could probably spend a whole podcast on that. But I think it is in mentorship and education and awareness. Um, and then I think you have to get to people really early. Like I, I think like, you know, elementary school is where we need to get in order to get people interested. And then as a business as well, creating an environment that's not a programmer culture, that's not based around ping pong tables and all of these kinds of things. And the diverse and focusing on things like diversity, which you're seeing now, if there's diversity, then, you know, single mothers feel welcome. Um, all of those kinds of things. I want to focus on building those environments so that it becomes more approachable um, for people who are interested in, in getting involved. I was in, I was involved in some uh, in the diversity program at some uh, one very 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 large corporation in particular in yeah. the past, and um, I have seen it in practice in any number of spaces, um, including the Drupal world. Um, the more different backgrounds of people you have approaching a problem and looking at it, uh, the better your solution is yeah. going to be. There's just there's no way around it, um, and Pick, when I say background, pick gender, religion, geogra- geography, mm. anything. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, the more different people you have looking at something, the better the solution is going to be. And it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a powerful force. Yeah. And I'm surprised in, in a business culture that focuses so much on opt- optimization, mm. right? And getting the most out of your resources and getting the best out of your resources that, that, that just hasn't quite arrived in Uh, technology. Yeah. And I I feel like tech is, I mean, there's a ton of diversity reports that have come out where people are like, we're not doing well. And this is what we're going to do to try and fix it. Because we all know that when we're trying to solve a problem, when we want to have, especially if you're trying to solve a problem that is a universal problem, good luck building a technology. If you're all just a bunch of people in the Silicon Valley solving your own problem, built, drinking your own Kool-Aid, you need to have everybody represented. You need to have low incomes, different languages, different ethnicities. And so I think technology gets that, but it will be solved through education and accessibility and exposure, not, you know, really prize fighting narratives about how much, you know, what this company is doing against this company that I don't think makes it an approachable industry for people. I think that people like the idea of innovation and the democratization that is happening with a lot of this. Um, but if you're if you make it not inclusive, if you don't make it about what makes you unique and what you bring to the table, but you make it about you know the cool kids or the early adopters or you know only the Silicon Valley. I think you see the decentralization of the Silicon Valley is a good thing because then people feel like it is something that they could do. Um, and I, I hope that that's where the continued investment goes in, in order for people to feel like this is something as normal as becoming a nurse or a doctor. Yeah, and actually dissolving the rock star myth is important too, yeah. because a ton of technology is completely uh, manageable, it's learnable yeah. skills that you can acquire as a regular person in you know, studying in the evening or working on yeah. the weekend or it, at your school. Um, you can get into technology and change 
the world and shape our future. And yep. and uh, the message that oh, it only you know the gurus, right? right? Only the ninjas. Like that's that's uh, actually quite off putting to people yeah. who don't want to be ninjas or rock stars. Exactly. And I think it. I mean, what I see um, having worked in technology for ten years is that. Often the people who are creating have a humility. Well, they have to have a humility and an egolessness, especially if they're working in an open source environment, because people are punching their ideas apart and they want to be collaborative. And those things are required. And you see them a lot in technology teams. But as businesses evolve, you don't see the same level of vulnerability and the same level of humility. And I, I hope in my practice in working with practitioners that if we can fundamentally go hey, we're all trying to solve these problems. No one's perfect. Stop talking about rock stars and how amazing you all are and lead with a little bit of, here's the problem we're trying to solve. This is what we know. This is what we don't know. Can you help us? Right. And build more partnerships that it'll become a workplace that might have a lot more talent in the top of the funnel. So you use the magic words. <laughs> Do you have um, specific memory of the first time you heard about this crazy thing called open source software? Mm -hmm. I do. Um, I worked in video games before. Um, and so that was my first, I was a teacher before and then I worked in video games. And that I wanted to learn as much about the business as I could because I believe if you don't know what your business is and then your people, then you can't help them. Um, and so I asked a lot of questions about, you know, what, what do I not know? I'm not a highly technical person. Um, so I got lost in a lot of it. And then I was like, well, tell me what the broad trends and themes are and what is, what people are passionate about in this space, because I'm not going to understand the coding technology. I can understand the word, but I don't in practice. Um, and then tell me about workflows. And so in that moment, I was talking to a director, uh, he was a producer in the video game, and we were making a so calm, so me picture. And he was walking me through this uh, idea of working out loud. And he was like, in order to, because I said, how do you, how would I, as an HR person, ever even think about being able to competency test somebody in engineering? And because I wouldn't be able to look at their code and say if it was good or not. And he said, oh, there's a whole other way that we try and support each other is that it's open source and you can actually peer review and you can do all of these things. And as a teacher going into the tech sector in HR, I was like, this is the best thing that's ever happened. Because, of course, as a teacher, it's so top down. It's the teacher knows the answer and you teach the student. And what I loved about this concept was that it had really brought it into a group setting. And I was like, this is an amazing way to learn and an amazing way to not um, to not take ownership um, and to create like an equalizing feeling. So it was in that business that they didn't necessarily work that way, um, but that they were fascinated by it and they would bring in any piece of material they could uh, to talk about like, what would that look like? How would that change our business? And for me that I took that and thought, that doesn't just need to apply to engineering. Fascinating. Yeah. So I'm going to skip over all the things I was about to ask you because <laughs> you should jump right into, I didn't want to apply that just to engineering. And in shorthand, it's like the horizontal culture and the not competing on commodity functionality mm -hmm. and, and all these themes we have in open source plus yeah. business. You know, a company... Uh, that's not an IT company shouldn't compete on IT and building a CMS, right? You right. should compete on, like if you're Sony and Warner, who both use Drupal, right? You should compete on music marketing and, and like let Drupal take care of digital marketing. Yes. Example. Okay. That shortcut we did. <laughs> but how is it that you said, I, 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 uh, this shouldn't apply just to, to, to code? Yeah. I think because I was a teacher and because in, in teaching you have to teach multiple subjects. It's not, I wasn't just a math teacher. I taught PE, I taught art, I taught social sciences. And so you, you think holistically, you try and find ways that you can bring practices across the board. Um, and sometimes you can't. But that seemed like more of a philosophy and a mindset than it seemed like a practical skill application. And that's something that you can draw to unite people um, and I saw it as something that 
if you looked at the finance sector, well, they have associations that they work in these practices um, and they're so, and they need certifications and they need all of these kinds of things, but are they sharing those ideas or are they getting accredited? And then I thought about um, the HR function being, you work in a cloak of darkness a lot of the time. There are things you need to do for compliance, information you need to know can be quite isolating um, if you are a sole practitioner, which a lot of companies are, where you're the only HR person doing everything and you have all the secrets. And so I thought, wow, like how are we in organizations that are small or large, how are we taking ideas like this of sharing and collaboration and peer reviewing? Um, they existed in performance management systems and stuff like that. It already all exists, but it's not that inspirational. It's more so workflow. How do we like actually create a mindset that aligns the finance function, who are very, very different, than the engineering function and the sales function, who are also very, very different? That becomes to me cultural DNA. And that's interesting. Hmm. 